Gosh, what a well-behaved group. This is, uh, this is really impressive. Well, good afternoon. I'm Mike Peters, the president of St. John's College. <laughs> the fix wasn't in. I didn't pay that person to do it. To do it. Uh, and on behalf of the faculty and the staff and students at St. John's, we want to welcome you all to this wonderful conference on this wonderful Santa Fe Day and Santa Fe Weekend. Um, we have a number of events um, that's surrounding the 50th anniversary, which we're gonna remind you of because it's on your name tag, of St. John's College in Santa Fe. Uh, they're focused on members of the community, on our programs, uh, events for the alumni, for friends, for students, for faculty and staff. Um, and this conference, though, is the centerpiece uh, of that celebration because it focuses on what is the heart of the college for us, um, our hope and commitment to liberal education and our program of instruction. And it's an opportunity for us at the college to pause and with your help to reflect on, our, on this commitment to liberal education and specifically how we approach such an education but more generally and maybe more importantly, how to understand and articulate the strengths and dare I say value of liberal education and of, of those challenges that are facing us and how to think about them and how to address them. Uh, there are a number of people who are responsible for uh, bringing us all together for this conference and there's Two that I would like to particularly mention first are tutor Judith Adam, who was the chair of the faculty and staff committee that helped put this all together. Um, and I don't know that Judith's in, yes she is, there she is. Judith, thank you so much. <laughs> And Dean Walter Sterling, who has done everything from the conceptual right down to choosing the wines for, uh, for this. And we really appreciate that. And I want to also especially thank the Mellon Foundation. Uh, as probably many of you in this room know, the Mellon Foundation has been a stalwart supporter of liberal education, one of those few foundations that hangs on to the truth. Uh, and it was a very generous grant from the Mellon Foundation that has helped uh, make this uh, conference possible and we're eternally grateful to them for this and for all the other things they do on behalf of all of us uh, in, in liberal education. So let me just uh, wrap up again by saying thank you, welcome, it's wonderful to have you here. I hope you enjoy and benefit from the conference as much as I know all of us at the college will. And with that, I would like to turn it over to tutor Andy Kingston, who's going to introduce our opening speaker, Christopher Ricks. Andy. It is my great pleasure to welcome Christopher Ricks back to Santa Fe um, and the campus of St. John's College. Professor Ricks was the 2011-2012 Steiner Lecturer on this campus, as well as the Steiner Lecturer this past year on the Annapolis campus. And we are honored that he has returned to join our celebrations marking the 50th anniversary of the founding of this campus. Professor Ricks is the Warren Professor of the Humanities and the co-director of the Editorial Institute at Boston University. He was professor of poetry at the University of Oxford from 2004 to 2009, and also lectures at the New College of the Humanities in London. I won't list all of his works, but the bookstore has a number of them, and I encourage you to go, to go get some. But his critical studies range from John Milton to Bob Dylan, and he has edited numerous poetry collections, including editions of Tennyson and T.S. Eliot. And if you do happen to pick up something from the bookstore, uh, Christopher has uh, agreed to to, to sign those outside uh, afterwards, if you would like. In a 2011 article in the Times Literary Supplement defending the New College of the Humanities, Professor Ricks wrote the following, which seems to me to speak to us directly here at St. John's, particularly regarding the place of the formal lecture in the St. John's program. And I quote, I never forget how much my university education owed to tutorials and to seminars. 
but many of my most memorable experiences as a student were of lectures. It is extraordinary how many kinds of power a lecture can manifest, can wield, and can create. Lectures present an extended, substantiated account, at once imaginative and scholarly, not for the immediate response or critique that valuably characterizes the tutorial or seminar, but for subsequent pondering and reflection and conversation among ourselves. Here are the hum and the buzz that arise from an audience that has common interests, that values the common pursuit of true judgment, quoting T.S. Eliot, and that finds itself often to its delighted surprise, arriving at the sense of a common cause. Please help me welcome Christopher Ricks, who will speak to us this afternoon about T.S. Eliot's humanism. Thank you. T.S. Eliot's humanism, both in the sense of what it meant to Eliot, humanism, what the word meant, and the ways in which he does himself embody humanism. But I want to start with humanity in its double sense. It's, as we all know, it's the noun from human and the noun from humane. And the hope or faith vested in the word is one that hopes that humanity will behave humanely. And I'm going to start with a letter that Eliot wrote to Miss Alice Quinn, age 16, who is not the Alice Quinn who matters in the American literary scene at the moment because the letter is from 1952. Uh, so here is the letter, which to me is not only an extraordinary summary of many things that matter to humanism, uh, but an extraordinary act of humanity. 19th of February, 1952. Dear Miss Alice Quinn, I do not often answer letters because I am too busy but I liked your letter, and I'm glad that you are at a Catholic school. I cannot tell you how to concentrate, because that is something I've been trying to learn all my life. There are spiritual exercises in concentration, but I'm not the person to teach what I'm trying to learn. All I know is that if you're interested enough and care enough, then you concentrate. But nobody can tell you how to start writing. The only good reason for writing is that one has to write, you ask seven questions. No one event in one's childhood starts one writing, no doubt a number of events and other causes. That remains mysterious. My advice to up and coming writers is don't write at first for anyone but yourself. It doesn't matter how many or how few universities one goes to. What matters is what one learns, either at universities or by oneself. My favorite essay, I think, is my essay on Dante, not because I think I know much about Dante, but because I loved what I wrote about. The Wasteland is my most famous work, and therefore, perhaps, will prove the most important, but it is not my favorite. I'm interested to hear that Kunitz and Haycraft, work of reference, say that I prefer to associate with nobility and church dignitaries, but I like to know every sort of person, including nobility and dignitaries. I also like to know policemen, plumbers, and people. One does not always need to know a subject very well in order to teach it. What one does need to know is how to teach. In, um, I went to a very good school, which no longer exists, in St. Louis, Missouri, where I was well taught in Latin, Greek, French, and elementary mathematics. Those are the chief subjects worth learning at school, and I'm glad that I was well taught in these subjects, instead of having to sub study such subjects as T.S. Eliot. At the university, I studied too many subjects and mastered none. If you study Latin, Greek, French, mathematics in the essentials of the Christian faith, that is the right beginning. I like living in London because it is my city, and I'm happier there than anywhere else. With best wishes, T.S. Eliot. I, I think it's a very touching letter, a beautiful letter. It touches on an immense number of the things that are the subject of this conference and so on. So that's why my delight in choosing it. My delight in choosing it, though, is also a tribute to Valerie Elliott, whose death we mourn. Um, Valerie Elliott had the generosity and the humanity to give this letter to a volume of which Eliot himself might not have approved. That is a, a charity volume, Hockney's Alphabet, to raise money for people living with AIDS. 
Now, Eliot was not an un ungenerous person, but I think it's an act of singular generosity in his widow to have handed over this letter for the alphabet. And the letter is beautifully not attached to any one letter of the alphabet. It's attached to ampersand. This is the only, <laughs> it's the only thing in the book which isn't a letter. There it is, as an ampersand. I think it is a genuinely humanitarian move by Mrs. Eliot, and the word humanitarian is one which Eliot was suspicious of, partly because of its religious sense and the way in which that, the way in which it was in conflict with Orthodox Christianity. Um, the conflict within the word humanism, the necessary tension between the different senses that he has, is evident in the Oxford English Dictionary. We know that. Earlier, it could mean belief in the mere humanity of Christ. I've started to watch the word mere lately. Um, I think if one thinks of something as solely something or other, it's usually the better way of putting it than merely something or other. And Eliot himself has a rather tendentious recourse to mere and merely. It's the character or quality of being human, devoted to human interests. It's any system of thought or action which is concerned with merely human interests, and the Oxford English Dictionary is going for the word rather there. And it is, of course, in the main sense of this conference, devotion to those studies which promote human culture, literary culture, especially the system of the humanists, the study of the Roman, and so on. That we all know. Dennis Donahue recently wrote uh, the introduction to the Daedalus volume what humanists do, and he began earlier this year, he began by saying, it is a minor embarrassment that the words humanist and humanism are regularly found on the same page of big dictionaries. Uh, he doesn't sound embarrassed by it at all, nor should he be. Indeed, it's a great convenience to him as a way into his, into his article. We should always watch it when people say they're embarrassed by something and wonder if we could actually contemplate them genuinely blushing at finding the word <laughs> humanist in the word. Um, but the tension between the different senses uh, is very, very important. The contributors to this issue of Daedalus are humanists because they work on the humanities and teach them, often under conditions that seem unpropitious, allusion to Eliot's lines, of course, in colleges and universities. What they are otherwise in their personal and social lives is none of my business. Now, um, it isn't any of De uh, Dennis's business, that is true, but it remains something in which we all have to think about. That is, we have to think about the relation between Christianity and humanism. We shouldn't use lightly Christian humanism as if it didn't present any sort of tension and difficulty. It is not a paradox like the paradoxes or oxymorons that we used to, but there is a valuable tension between the different senses of the term. And that comes out, I can spend a little bit of time now with uh, Eliot's um, amiable quarrel with Irving Babbitt, which is where his writings on humanism essentially begin. Um, I'll, I'll read something to you, and what I will try to do, please, is identify things which, I, which it would be good to argue with the author about. Humanism is either an alternative to religion or is ancillary to it. To my mind, it always flourishes most when religion has been strong, and if you find examples of humanism which are anti-religious, or at least in opposition to the religious faith at the place and time, then such humanism is purely destructive, for it has never found anything to replace what it destroyed. Any religion, of course, is forever in danger of petrifaction into mere ritual and habit, though ritual and habit be essential to religion. It is only renewed and refreshed by an awakening of feeling and fresh devotion or by the critical reason. The latter may be the part of the humanist. But if so, then the function of humanism, though necessary, is secondary. So the moments I'd want to identify as were conversationally for this, if in the characteristics and John's uh, manner, this were then a text to engage in a principled and courteous conversation about, it would be something like this. The religious faith of the place and time. Are we confident that there is one such thing? We could be less and less confident of it, but was it really the case, in, as it were, in, in Harvard in, in Eliot's day, that the religion faith and faith of the place and time are in the singular? 
They're not religious faiths. There's the religious faith of the place and time. Um, any religion is in danger of petrifaction. On other occasions, Eliot notes that it's also always in danger of putrefaction. That is, we really mustn't set it up that the, the, there isn't still an angeribus. Uh, there's, the, there's the rock of petrifaction, and there's the terrible, the terrible fluidity of, of putrefaction. Eliot himself says very beautifully, I am as cherry of order, as cherry of order, as of disorder. But it was not natural to him to be equally cherry. He was actually much more cherry of disorder, though disorder was repeatedly the source of extraordinary uh, fecundity and beauty and wisdom in his own writing, as indeed in the writing of Poe. Um, the, the latter, that is the critical reason, may be the part of the humanist, but if so, though necessary, it is secondary. Now, I'm very uneasy about primary and secondary here. If you have a compound, it doesn't make sense to think of something as primary or secondary. My students at Boston University are always trying to get me to say what the really important thing is about the work that we're looking at. But the really important thing is the relationship between that thing and everything else that is in it. And that's a, that's a very wise thought of Eliot's own, but it's a thought that, like all of us, he sometimes forgets. One's own thoughts are no more uh, endlessly available than any other people's thoughts. So in a compound, like water, it doesn't make sense to say clearly it's the hydrogen that's really important because there's twice as much of it. No, no, you only get, if the contribution played by humanism is of the kind that Eliot is describing, you can't get at it through notions of primary and secondary. There could be something very, very tiny about the aeroplane that was indispensable to its flying successfully. Uh, and it's much, much better, I think, to think, as Eliot's art does in terms of compound, pounds. Um, he has his own rhetoric, uh, as we all do. Um, we're better at spotting other people's rhetorical moves than at spotting our own, uh, which is why we need friends who are uh, genuinely critical of us on occasion. Um, uh, he says about Babbitt, it is the joints of his edifice, not the materials, that sometimes seem a bit weak. Now, I think he means, what he conveys you is that they are weak. But instead of saying that they are weak, he needs the triple prophylaxis of sometimes seem a bit weak. Now, we, 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 shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. The, we shouldn't put in a, in a tentatively courteous and scrupulously judged way that which is not actually a point of that kind at all. Uh, it is the John. Uh, well, let me give you the whole set sentences. Mr. Babbitt's critical judgment is exceptionally sound, and there is hardly one of his several remarks that is not by itself acceptable. It is the joints of his edifice, not the materials, that sometimes seem a bit weak. Now, I think that's intimating one thing, but not taking the responsibility for it. And the, sa the same, I think, is true of this. And unless by civilization you mean material progress, cleanliness, etc., which is not what Mr. Babbitt means, if you mean a spiritual and intellectual coordination on a high level, then it is doubtful whether civilization can endure without religion and religion without a church. Now, it is doubtful, seems to me, not to be facing the responsibility of saying that, if you believe, as Eliot does, that actually civilization cannot endure without religion, and religion cannot endure without a church, then you should up front say so. But what this does is say it is doubtful. Well, everything is doubtful. Uh, everything really is doubtful, uh, because doubt is essential to faith. Eliot believes in the necessity for faith, and to believe in faith is to believe that you do not know. There is, an, there is a doubt which you overcome, and it is in overcoming that doubt that you deserve to be honored. So the word doubtful can't really be, it gives the impression that, as it were, Eliot is a very busy man. Had he more time, he would lay out the ground, he would substantiate this as a point, but he doesn't substantiate it. Um, he is, Justifiably, I think, um, tart when it is suggested that he would, that he is an enemy of humanism. I believe that it is better to recognize the weaknesses of humanism at once and allow for them, 
so that the structure may not crash beneath an excessive weight and so that we may arrive at an enduring recognition of its value for us and of our obligation. Now, the, that, in, that re enduring recognition of its value is something which he then returns to in the second of the humanist essays, Second Thoughts About Humanism. So the first is uh, Humanism and Irving Babbitt. The second is Second Thoughts About Humanism. Eliot says, I was just wanting to point to its weak points before some genuine enemy took advantage of them. So Eliot is telling you he's not a genuine enemy, though that too is a slightly equivocal way of putting it. Um, it, humanism, can be and is already of immense value but it must be subjected to criticism while there is still time. And again, this seems to be an entirely honorable position that he's taking, though it is swathed in the wish to propitiate more people than you can propitiate on any one occasion. He gives a list of what for him constitutes um, uh, hum true humanism. One, the function of humanism is not to provide dogmas or philosophical theories. Humanism, because it is general culture, is not concerned with philosophical foundations. It is concerned less with reason than with common sense. When it proceeds to exact definitions, it becomes something other than itself. Well, what I would identify here is the danger of putting reason in inverted commas or scare quotes. Do you mean reason or do you not mean reason? You put it in the quotation marks and that allows you to float it without again actually taking responsibility for it. Um, the contrast of reason as against common sense. Two, humanism makes for breadth, tolerance, equilibrium and sanity. It operates against fanaticism. Great tribute. Three, the world cannot get on without breadth, tolerance, and sanity, any more than it can get on without narrowness, bigotry, and fanaticism. <laughs> now, um, I understand, I think it's very witty <laughs> to have said that last thing, but how am I supposed to take this? I mean, actually, we could get on <laughs> without those things, and we would get on better without those things. So what is happening to the, to the rhetoric of the performance? He's a great performer. Uh, four, it is not the business of humanism to, ref to refute anything. It is critical rather than constructive. It is necessary for the criticism of social life and social theories, political life and political theories. And then he musters his particular hate list. Without humanism, we could not cope with Mr. Shaw, Mr. Wells, Earl Russell, <laughs> and you wonder we'll move from Mr. to Earl, Earl being with n not higher but lower. Earl Russell, <laughs> Mr. Mencken, Mr. Sandberg, Monsieur Claudel, Herr Ludwig, Mrs. McPherson, or the governments of America and Europe. <laughs> so, so this is, now again, it, it's, a terrific, it's a terrific bit of writing, but it is not, it, it is not behaving responsibly now, is it? Um, no. Humanism can have no positive theories about philosophy or theology. All that it can ask in the most tolerant spirit is, is this particular philosophy or religion civilized or is it not? Well, it can ask more than is it civilized or is it not? I mean, that is, there are clearly degrees of civilization. It's not either or you're either civilized or you're not. I'm reminded of what for me is the, the great humanist version um, of a question. The one imperative question is, is this true? Uh, another, and I think the more usual humanist question is, what truth is there in this? Now, what truth there is there in this is not a more important or a more valuable question than is it true, but it is a very, very different question. Uh, it moves you towards degrees of acquiescence, degrees of conviction. Uh, it has a quite different relation to belief from is this true or not. And positive is a really dangerous word. Um, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Boston University, after a meeting recently, when I had objected to the, to the wording of a decanal document, uh, which um, <coughs> it said that these concerns must now take a back seat to larger goals. Um, I didn't see how something could take a back seat to a larger goal. I didn't see why you wanted a larger goal, because the whole part of the sport is that the goal should be the same size, and so on. <laughs> and after the meeting, she said to me, 
can you never say anything positive? <laughs> and I said, quick as a flash, but imperiled, I said, hygiene is positive. <laughs> now, and that is a real question about negativity and, po and, and the positive. Uh, Eliot's own view of humanism is that it is hygienically necessary. And it's no good saying that all, all the, it's only a matter of unhygienic. No, no, it, it's, it's deeper than that. Uh, the essay on humanism, which Eliot did not reprint, unfortunately, is the one called Religion Without Humanism. And it is well worth looking up. It's a pity he didn't rep reprint it because it gives his case, his very powerful case, for humanism. He calls it, though, a very useful ingredient in a world which is no better than it is. And again, the figure of speech and ingredient seems to me one that we would want to stay with. It might be something that is not merely an ingredient in the sense it doesn't matter whether you do or don't add cinnamon to it, but it might be something which is more than ingredient in that the compound is not, is not created unless this is present within it. But he, he says this. Um, the ideal world will be the ideal church but very little knowledge of human nature is needed to convince us that hierarchy is liable to corruption and certainly to stupidity, that religious belief when unquestioned and uncriticized is liable to degenerate into superstition, that the human mind is much lazier than the human body, and that the communion of saints in Tibet is of a very low order. I resent and resist that last remark. I don't think that Eliot at this state would have been able to conduct a spirited viva voce examination of himself on the quality of, of, the, of Tibetan sanctity. I mean, that is, he certainly knew a lot about the East, there's not any question about that. But it's thrown in, it seems to me, simply to say very little knowledge of human nature is needed to know that the communion of saints in Tibet is of a very low order. No, no, you don't know these things through knowledge of human nature. You know these things through a close study of particular institutions, the context of which has to be real to you. But the position that he's taking here, I think, is admirable in its admiring humanism. If we cannot rely, and it seems that we can never rely, upon adequate criticism from within, it's better that there should be criticism from without. For there is no doubt in my mind that contemporary religious institutions are in danger from themselves. And the whole of this uh, shortish essay, which is well worth looking at, um, is concerned with this. I have already said what I think of humanism without religion. I respect it. The grounds for the previous respect actually are not really clear, uh, but he's moved into a statement of respect. I respect it, but believe it to be sterile. Religion without humanism produces the vulgarities and the political compromises of Roman Catholicism. The vulgarities and the fanaticism of Tennessee it produces Mrs. McPherson, and it produces liberal uplift, and it produces the Bishop of Birmingham. For it is the chief point of this short paper that religion without humanism produces the opposite and conflicting types of religious bigotry. But he has told us that the world needs bigotry in the earlier period. So the, the, the thing, is, the thing is, is the kind of rich confusion uh, which in the poetry again and again creates something magnificent. But in prose discourse, I think, does not. Uh, let me let me skip, jump that. Sorry. So, what would the criticisms that humanism? If you think of humanism as critical, if you if you believe as I do that it doesn't quite make sense to say that the critical is not a positive contribution and so on, what would the humanists' possible criticisms of Eliot be. And again, I'm thinking of t identifying things in a way for discussion. He writes to Stephen Spender, 1932. What really matters, and I want to resist that immediately, the whole rhetoric of what really matters. What really matters is not what I think about the church today, or about capitalism, or military processions, or about communism. What matters is whether I believe in original sin. Now, I think a humanist ought to say to that, no, no, what matters is the relationship between what you believe about original sin and the church today, 
and capitalism and military processions and communism, all of which figure in some way in your, in your writings, in your poems. That is, military processions is Coriolan, triumphal march. And the relationship, so there's this wish, what I really is going to set aside, and I want to, want to quote the bit of Eliot I had in mind and failed to quote a little bit earlier. He said it should be the task of a literary review um, to maintain the autonomy and disinterestedness of literature, and at the same time to exhibit the relations of literature, not to life, but to all, contrasted with literature, but to all the other things which together with literature are the components of life. Don't ever set up a contrast of literature and life because literature is just as much a, uh, a feature within life as anything else. Uh, it maintain the autonomy of literature, but also show the relation of literature to all the other things which together with literature constitute life. So that it seems to me the amputation here, so it's not this that matters, this that. that is not the spirit in which his poems are created. Uh, I want to quote a letter to uh, Bonamy Dobre in 1936. The doctrine that in order to arrive at the love of God, one must divest oneself of the love of created beings, was thus expressed by St. John of the Cross, you know. That is a man who was writing primarily not for you and me, but for people seriously engaged in pursuing the way of contemplation. It is only to be read in relation to that way that is, merely to kill one's human affection or get one nowhere, it would be only to become rather more completely a living corpse than most people are. But the doctrine is fundamentally true, I believe, or to put your belief in your way, that only through the love of created beings can we approach the love of God, that I do believe to be untrue in capitals. Whether we mean by that domestic and friendly affections or a more comprehensive love of the neighbor, of humanity in general, I don't think that ordinary human affections are capable of leading us to the love of God, but rather that the love of God is capable of informing, intensifying, and elevating our human affections, which otherwise may have little to distinguish them from the natural affections of animals. Um, I think it's very thrillingly written. I mean, I think many of these letters are magnificently written. But again, if I want to identify the, the, the moments, what will they be? Well, it's to say that you need to know that St. John of the Cross is saying divest yourself of the love of created beings is speaking only for somebody, not for you and me, but for those seriously engaged in pursuing the way of contemplation. But in that case, how can that be the epigraph to Sweeney Agonistes? Hence the soul cannot be possessed of the divine union until it has divested itself of the love of created beings. Eliot cannot have believed that the readers of Sweeney Agonistes would have known the point about the, the way of contemplation, or the, the readers of Sweeney Agonistes are the you and me, the Eliot and the Bonhomie de Bray in the letter itself. And again, notice what happens when he says, that the, the, if you believe that the love of God and so on, otherwise may have little to distinction. Little to distinction means not nothing. Uh, so there is something that would distinguish this from, from Durin. What I'm suggesting, that whole rhetoric of saying little to distinguish is a rhetoric which says, well, hang on then, what is the little? Because a little can make an immense difference. Eliot himself says, for certain writers, uh, the extraordinary way in which they, they can be original with the minimum of alteration. Now, that, I think, is a wise remark, but it must mean that if there is little difference between be this one belief and the other, there is a difference, not that there is no difference. There's a whole rhetoric. Yeah, you, you'll have seen it in politics everywhere. It is hard to see why somebody has done so and so. If you mean impossible, say impossible. If you mean hard, then stay with it and wrestle with it and see whether it is impossibly hard. Uh, but it's basically a, a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of re certain kind of rhetoric. It's a very it's a wonderful letter to, to Dobre. Uh, it ends um, yours perpetually, T, <laughs> um, which is a, a confidence in in the afterlife, um, an excessive love of created beings. Um, his attack on Paul Elmer Moore of the utmost courtesy, I'm perturbed by your comments on hell. 
to me it is justitia sapienza amore. And I cannot help saying, with all due respect to a somewhat younger and much more ignorant man, that I am really shocked by your assertion that God did not make hell. It seems to me that you have lapsed into humanitarianism. The Buddhist eliminates hell only by eliminating everything positive about heaven. Is your God Santa Claus? It's a sort of wonderful letter. But I have to say, if I had to choose between making Santa Claus into a God and making Moloch, into a god, I would prefer Santa Claus. But Eliot is, al- is always terrified of sentimental lapses. Of Middleton Murray, yet he has seen far more clearly than others the real issue, the choice that one must make. The fact that you must either take the whole of revealed religion or none of it. Now, I can't, simply can't get my mind around that. The whole of revealed religion is clearly not going to be limited then to Christianity. I and mean, Christianity does not have a monopoly of, of revelation. How, what would it, how could a person, what would it mean to say you must either take the whole of a revealed religion or none of it? It's driving to, it's driving to decision where I think decision is simply unimaginable. Before his conversion in 1927, you'll remember he describes himself as brought up outside the Christian fold. Uh, Whether Unitarianism is Christian continues, I think, rightly to be a real question. Um, And certainly the the family was very, very shocked at what seemed to them to be an accusation uh, when 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 he speaks so. But in 1917, 10 years before he becomes a Christian, and an Englishman. Uh, this is the way in which he writes, and I think we can't ever repudiate things that strike a chord with us, even if the author could repudiate them. That is, John Crow Ransom can tell us that only 50 of his poems are worth reading, but we should not believe him. He, he can repudiate the poems, we should not, and I'm very p- glad to say that an edition of John Crow Ransom's collected poems will be coming out very soon. Uh, he, you have to trust the poems more than the writer of the poems, since I'm not good enough for him, perhaps, but no man or woman is a perfect judge of his or her own work. So here is, here's Eliot in 1917 on Collingwood. It is true that history and philosophy as Mr. Collingwood contends, are interdependent, but philosophy depends upon the whole course of history, not upon any particular signal and unique facts. And its freedom of interpretation is limited only by its obligation to exclude nothing. Religion, on the other hand, or at least the Christian religion, depends upon one important fact. Philosophy may show, if it can, the meaning of the statement that Jesus was the Son of God. But Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, must base itself upon a unique fact, that Jesus was born of a virgin, a proposition which is either true or false, its terms having a fixed meaning. Now, I think it is for me not an, I mean, as a, as an atheist humanist, uh, it is for me not enough for Eliot himself no longer to believe that. I want to know what the arguments are against this wonderfully lucid account that he gives in the International Journal of Ethics. As I want to know what his arguments would be against his own words, Mr. Collingwood admits that the universe as a totality is only in posse one is tempted to ask whether the omnipotence and absolute goodwill of God are also in posse. Now, that didn't cease to be a question, a real question, because Eliot came to believe that the answer to it was no, you shouldn't be tempted to ask that. See what I'm want, wanting to get at? I'm thinking of, I'm trying to apply seriously the princi- Eliot's own principle that humanism will offer a critique of religion, and I'm trying to identify the moments when this will be so. International Journal of Ethics, 1917. But to agree with the author that we must not only concede that intellect, imagination, science, and art would reach their culmination in the apprehension and contemplation of the supreme principle of the universe, adequately embodied and incarnate, but that this culmination is found in Christianity. 
And might it not be maintained that religion, however poor our lives would be without it, is only one form of satisfaction among others, among others rather than the culminating satisfaction of all satisfactions? Now, I think the young Eliot you know, in his late 20s is asking a real question there. And I go back to the thought that part of our responsibility to a, to a writer or a seer, a sage like Eliot, would be to not permit him or her simply to disown, without argument, things expressed with such, clar with such clarity and, f and force. The intellectual case for Christianity is very strong indeed, and one which demands a great deal of study. And to be quite fair, there is a good case to be made out for atheism as well. Now, I honor Eliot for writing that, but I think that it does create a, a problem. That is, there is a good case which apparently need never be addressed by him, um, despite his philosophical training. Let me give an example of, let me give please two examples of what for me are Christian humanism. This is a poem, The Hill Shade, by William Barnes. I thought to include it today because my friend Will, uh, Wendy Lesser is going to give a talk tomorrow, and it was in her excellent journal, The Three Penny Review, that I printed it. Um, it's a Victorian poem. I printed it with, with a few words. Uh, on the Hill Shade. At such a time of year and day, in ages gone, that steep hill brow cast down an evening shade that lay in shape, the same as lies there now, though then no shadows wheeled around the things that now are on the ground. The hill's high shape may long outstand the house of slowly wasting stone, the house may longer shade the land than man's on gliding shade is shown. The man himself may longer stay than stands the summer's rick of hay. The trees that rise with boughs of boughs, to me for trees long fallen may pass. And I could take those red-haired cows for those that pulled my first known grass. Our flowers seem yet on ground and spray, but oh, our people, where are they? Now, I think this is a great elegy. Um, it is entirely at one with Christian belief, but it in no way supposes that if you don't share Christian belief, you can't be moved by the poem. Uh, our people, where are they? The answer for Barnes would be in an afterlife that given how good most of them were is going to be heavenly. Uh, but it doesn't, but it remains a true humanist question. Oh, our people, where are they? I can see again, I can imagine this and I can, I find it exceptionally beautiful poem and had I world enough and time, I'd want to sort of take you through what it does with rhymes, why rhymes come back in a certain way, why assonances come back, all that difference between words that at the end of lines don't end day, lay, now, as they, as against around, ground, stand, land, all those terminations at the end of the line which resist any kind of ease, ease of movement. So that for me is, 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 a work, is a work of art that is committed to showing, realizing what is it, what you have to do if, like William Barnes, you write a Christian poem knowing very well that many people are no longer Christian. So, uh, the other great statement, I think, is the one by Wordsworth in the essay supplementary to the preface, where he needs to point out the terrible danger that you are in if you share the religious convictions of the people whose work you're reading. Um, Men who read from religious or moral inclinations, even when the subject is of that kind which they approve, are beset with misconceptions and mistakes peculiar to themselves. Attaching so much importance to the truths which interest them, they are prone to overrate the authors by whom those truths are expressed and enforced. They come prepared to impart so much passion to the poet's language that they remain unconscious how little, in fact, they receive from it. And on the other hand, religious faith is to him who holds it so momentous a thing 
and error appears to be attended with such tremendous consequences that if opinions touching upon religion occur which the reader condemns, he not only cannot sympathize with them, however animated the expression, but there is for the most part an end put to all satisfaction and enjoyment. Now, uh, Wordsworth's dev devoutness, is, uh, devotion, is, ca cannot be in question, but what it wants to do is criticize any complacency of congruence. That is, your, your, this, is a, this is the poem for you because it, it, it is congruent with what you believe. The two last things I want to do, one is to talk about belief in itself, because the, the humanist questions all raise questions of what it is to believe things. Uh, and Eliot has a, has a masterly insight here which he never developed and which I don't have the imagination to develop myself. We can say, I think, that belief is not a simple act of the mind of such a kind that to believe in the world of the schoolmen and to believe in a mechanistic universe are, as acts of believing, identical. We might even suggest that believing changes from age to age although no age will possess the terms in which to define the difference between its believing and that of any previous age. So it's very important to him to say it's not that they believed different things, it's that what they were doing when they're believing was a different thing to do. He says about the ideas in poems by Cowley in 17th century, they are certainly more coherent and orderly but are not believed by himself with the same intensity with which the ideas of Donne were entertained by himself. So he tries to, he says that we need a history of belief. Uh, and that sketch, I think, hasn't been fulfilled by anybody. And it is a very, very daunting task. It, it clearly will bring together six or eight or ten quite different disciplines and imaginative, uh, dis, uh, imaginative powers of mind and so on. Mind you, I am not speaking of the object of belief, but of the believing itself. He says of Poe, all of his ideas seem to be entertained rather than believed. And in a way, he would like to hold that against Poe, but he can't bring himself altogether to hold against Poe because he does believe that there is a value in entertaining beliefs. He thinks that you must never lose sight of the difference between holding a belief and entertaining it. But if you cannot bring yourself to entertain beliefs which you don't hold, you are condemned to a very, very narrow view indeed of what, uh, of what humanity is. The belief itself has been in constant mutation. He says about uh, Ramon Fernandez, he does not understand perhaps that in which Newman believed or tried to believe, but he understands better than almost anyone the way in which Newman believed or tried to believe it. So it is a great challenge, I think, that hasn't been picked. I think there is a very great deal in it, this idea, and I'm, it matters to me, of course, for two rather different reasons. One is that it opens that possibility of, of, of a critical spirit, which is positive. Um, it goes with what truth is there in this entertain the belief. The only way in which we, the only way in which we entertain with great sympathy opinions that we do not hold and which we may actually find abhorrent are by courtesy of friends and people whom we love and by courtesy of works of art. These are the great, these are the great occasions on which it is possible for us to entertain without simple acquiescence or becoming uh, brainwashed, uh, entertain beliefs that we do not hold. And it was very, very much the belief of William Empson, who is, I think, the, the really important adversary of Eliot in so many matters, the author of, uh, of a, a great many fine poems and of a great many fine works of criticism, as I hope you know. Let me just remind you of some of Empson. It strikes me that modern critics have become oddly resistant to admitting that there is more than one code of morals in the world whereas the central purpose of reading imaginative literature is to accustom yourself to this basic fact. I do not at all mean that a literary critic ought to avoid making moral judgments. That is useless as well as tiresome because the reader has enough sense to start guessing around it at once. It seems to me that the chief function of imaginative literature is to make you realize that other people are very various, many of them quite different from you, with different systems of value as well. 
but the effect of almost any orthodoxy is to hide this, to grasp a wide variety of experience imagining people with codes and customs very unlike our own. Now that's the sense in which I think Empson is more of a humanist than Eliot. The word dogma is for Eliot a, a simply approbatory term. He might have found some dogmas false, but the word dogma, about the word dogma, he has no reservation. Uh, and he says that he agrees with T. E. Hume that it's not that you accept the dogma because you want the sentiment. You accept the sentiment, often reluctantly, because you want the dogma. So I'm going to end with, uh, in a way that takes me back to me, I'm going to end with Marina. So let me read you Marina and say, quote something that Eliot said about it. One of the aerial poems, as you know. What seas, what shores, what grey rocks and what islands, what water lapping the bow and scent of pine and the wood thrush singing through the fog, what images return, O oh my daughter? Those who sharpen the tooth of the dog, meaning death. Those who glitter with the glory of the hummingbird, meaning death. Those who sit in the sty of contentment, meaning death. Those who suffer the ecstasy of the animals, meaning death, are become unsubstantial, reduced by a wind, a breath of pine, and the wood song fog, by this grace dissolved in place. What is this face less clear and clearer, the pulse in the arm less strong and stronger, given or lent, more distant than stars and nearer than the eye, whispers and small laughter between leaves and hurrying feet, under sleep where all the waters meet, bowsprit cracked with ice and paint cracked with heat. I made this, I have forgotten and remember, the rigging weak and the canvas rotten between one June and another September made this unknowing, half-conscious, unknown, my own. The garbage straight leaks, the seams need caulking. This form, this face, this life, living to live in a world of time beyond me. Let me resign my life for this life, my speech for that unspoken, the awakened, lips parted, the hope, the new ships. What seas, what shores, what granite islands towards my timbers and wood thrush calling through the fog, my daughter. Uh, William Empson, 1931, reviewed it when it came out. It's an astonishing piece of criticism to, for a review in the Nation and Athenaeum. Marina seems to be one of Mr. Eliot's very good poems, better than anything in Ash Wednesday. The dramatic power of his symbolism is here in full strength and the ideas involved have almost the range of interest, the full orchestra of the wasteland. One main reason for this is the balance maintained between otherworldliness and humanism. The essence of the poem is the vision of an order, a spiritual state, which he can conceive and cannot enter, but it's not made clear whether he conceives an order in this world to be known by a later generation, like Moses on Pisgah, or the life in heaven, which is to be obtained after death, like Dante. One might at first think the second only was meant, but Marina, after all, was a real daughter, is now at sea like himself rather than already in the promised land, and is to live in a world of time beyond me, which can scarcely be a description of heaven. At any rate, the humanist meaning is used at every point as a symbol of the otherworldly one, this seems the main point to insist on in a brief notice because it is the main cause of the richness of the total effect. In either case, the theme is the peril and brevity of such vision. Now, the peril and brevity is something, I think, which the religious and the non-religious could agree upon. Eliot says, uh, writing to the editor of the Arden edition of the play, Yes, Marina was suggested by the recognition scene in Shakespeare's Pericles and has to do, of course, with the same father-daughter relationship. I had no daughter. Now, I find that a really extraordinary thing for him to say, I had no daughter. I have no daughter would, would not be the same at all. It's as if in some extraordinary way, this, this, is his most, this is his most tender poem. It's full of terrible pain and grief and loss. But it's very I had no daughter, but the relationship interested me. Uh, 
um, and interested in sort of pulling itself together after the sort of proper throb and so on. Uh, and of course, recognition, in my experience, is something that comes repeatedly in life. He wrote to uh, John Haywood soon after publishing this poem, I have no family, no career, and nothing particular to look forward to in this world. I doubt the permanent value of everything I've written. I never lay with a woman I liked, loved, or ever felt any strong physical attraction to. I no longer even regret this lack of experience. I no longer even feel acutely the desire for progeny which was very acute once. Now, all of those things go into the poem. You don't need to know them to value the poem, but if you're fascinated, as some of us are, by how poems come into being, this is how it comes into being. And the contrast in due course, blessedly, between the second Mrs. Eliot and the first Mrs. Eliot, the second Mrs. Eliot meant that no longer were those terrible things needing to be thought or said by him. The St. Louis Post Democrat, on the day of Eliot's first announced his first marriage. Um, it, 1915, it's a lot of international war news. There are a lot of terrible stories on the front of that. But the particularly ter terrible thing is Thomas Eliot weds abroad. <laughs> now, um, in the end, he, he wedded somebody that was better than abroad. But the, 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 the really extraordinary is immediately below this headline in caps, there is an upper and lower case with simply a narrow bar slays a girl and kills himself. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. No, thank you. Do, do ask a question if you would like to, please. Yes, it's at the page says, Thomas Eliot weds abroad. It then says his family it, his then his family are very tight-lipped. Of course, they deeply disapproved. Um, there's a little heading which, uh, which records that she... Um, I wish I had brought the a copy with me. It records that she danced at the Royal Academy and so on. The Royal Royal is doing a little bit, and she did have a double-barreled name, which will have slightly pleased... You know, uh, Haywood will slightly please. And it's, it says, the family don't really comment on it, though we know that they were against it. It then says, just below it, slays girl and kills himself. And it tells you the story of a young couple who had married against their parents' wishes, where the man had decided that, they, that it would not work and where he kills the girl and kills himself. Um, it's, very, it's just one of these terrifying things. It's the world of Marshall McLuhan and simply having one thing juxtaposed with another. It has other terrifying marital misery stories on the same page. It, it's just very, very you, you should look at, I mean, you should look it up. I'm not good at finding things on screens. Uh, but uh, 1915, the St. Louis Post Democrat, and it is a very, very extraordinary page because it's got a, a woman being poisoned by her unfaithful husband on the front page. And it's, it's sort of doing a girl in is a big Elliot preoccupation. Thank you. That was all I meant. Thank you. Thank you. Please, you have the air of somebody who's about to say something. <laughs> 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 So, at one point, uh, you said that we shouldn't, if, if something an author has written thrills us somehow, uh, we, we, should, we should keep ourselves accountable to that, whether they were TV or not, right? Or we should continue to think it's important whether they do or not. And then later, when you were talking about Wordsworth, I think it was, uh, it, you seem to be advocating um, not. Don't just read things you agree 
agreement might be that it is possible for a person of great intelligence, imagination, and goodness to believe this thing, though I don't believe it myself. That is George Herbert. Uh, George Herbert is for me the religious poet uh, who most makes me think that if I were able to believe in Christianity, it would be with his help. Uh, it, when I read him, I don't find myself believing uh, that Christianity is something other than the loathsome system of torture worship. Um, that's William Empson's phrase about it and so on. I, I quoted it once. I met the professor of theology at Cambridge, uh, Reverend uh, Professor Lamp. Uh, and he, I wonder he was called Lamp, but the whole world is all, it's all just symbols. So <laughs> Professor Lamp, <laughs> Prof <laughs> Professor Lamp mentioned William Empson. So I said to Professor Lamp, but, but what do you think about somebody who has publicly described Christianity as a loathsome system of torture worship? And Professor Lamp did not shake, but nodded his great locks, and he said, well, of course, there's a great deal in that. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so then, then I, was remind, I was reminded of Empson's, Empson's own description of the Church of England, uh, his praise of the Church of England for having kept Christianity at bay. Christianity <laughs> never really that's all. So uh, I, I don't mean to be flip, flippant. The, um, the, it, is, it is entirely honourable and right to value works of art because they confirm, corroborate, consolidate, put new heart into that which you believe. But there's also this other thing which is being brought to realize as has become harder and harder and harder. I really think this. Every letter in the Boston Globe believes that there's nothing to be said for any position other than the one that's in the letter. That is, once upon a time, people used to say, it is true that if you do so and so, you will gain A, B, and C. Let me just point out to you that they're not as valuable as, as the rest of the alphabet. But we've reached a point, this is this kind of terrible kind of, uh, uh, a terrible fierceness of repudiation, that either there's everything to be said or there's nothing to be said. That's why I'm drawn to the remark about either accept the whole of, of, of religious revelation. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, sorry. Yes, it could, I mean, and earlier, yes, it, if it meant that works of art were merely entertainment, Elliot, of course, did think that poetry is a superior form of entertainment, and it was very dangerous for poetry to cease to notice that that is what it was. It's, I, if, we, if I could take you back to the first point that you made, I'm not, all I'm saying is that really notable and telling and penetrating statements made by great writers um, should not, I think, simply be dismissed because the writer dismisses them. Uh, that is, the writer is no longer the same person as the person who originally wrote them. There could be, um, I suppose part of this is a belief which I may have voiced in this room on a previous occasion, that to, to study literature is to lose certain things as well as to gain certain things. Now, we prefer not to think that. We prefer to think that to, to have read this poem deeply and inquiringly for the tenth time is better than to read it for the first time. But in fact, uh, those of us who are in any profession pay a price for being in a profession. Uh, uh, forgive me, I'll say it again. Judges, judges are both more and less sensitive to justice than other people. If they were simply less sensitive, then we'd be cynical about the law, which we really mustn't be. If they were simply more sensitive, we would have a terrible problem with the ways in which judges repeatedly Doctors are both more and less sensitive to pain. Soldiers, professional soldiers are both more. Now, we are very reluctant, I think, as teachers to admit that we gave up all life as sacrifice. Um, we gave up an immense lot when we decided ever to talk about poets. 
editor, edit them and so on. I mean, I love the work that I do, but my brother was able to read a poem for no reason other than that it would come to him. And when his wife died of cancer, he could read the waste remains, the waste remains and kills, in a way which I can't, I can't read it. Do you know what I mean? It's, so that, that's, sort of, that's sort of part of the story, but it's a different part from the one about taking people's word for it that there was nothing in what they had previously said. See, I think, I think that remark about religion uh, as, is it necessary the satisfaction of all satisfactions? And it's left there, I think, unattended to by Eliot and would be worth our attending to it. Sorry, I've, I've spoken to much. Sorry, please. entirely agree with that. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, I think if I, if you know, a personal, personal anecdote, my oldest child a few years ago became a Christian, or in his words, he received into the Church of England. I asked a question about the village that he lives in, and they said, uh, speaking of the vicar, I thank God to let you know that I have been received into the Church of England. So I shook him by the hand. I didn't know what to say. I certainly didn't quote, but William Emerson is right, it's a little sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I shook him by the hand and so on. Now, what's the kind of, it, it has combined with, as it were, it makes me entertain. Where might the passion come in? Well, next to him at a funeral of a Catholic woman whom we both knew, he knows everything about how to behave. And when he kneels, he does move me. Um, do, do, I mean, uh, I'm, I don't actually, I don't envy him. I'm not, I'm, that is, I, I don't envy people who believe in eternal life. I think Beckett is right, you know. Better, better on your ass than on your feet. Flat on your back than either dead than the lot. Uh, so, so, so that's, that's the sort of creed of certain sort of But so it's not people who are saying, don't you envy people who believe in? No, no, actually I don't. But I, I, it's, not, it's not difficult to feel, I don't think it's difficult to feel passionately. It's not the same as identifying with, you see. It, it, identifying with did a terrific lot of harm because it abolishes the other. That's identifying with says, it came up terribly with Princess Diana. People would write letters saying, you know, my husband has big ears and is under the impression he's going to inherit the throne and, and talks to plants. And so I said, I identify with Princess Diana. Now, you ought to care terrifically about people who are not like you. Who are not like you. Um, Jeremy, you're not identifying with them. Sympathy is possible without that input, but my students only like works in which they can identify with something, where they feel it's as if there's a, I can care about that because it's happening to me. That, that's, that's terribly selfish. But I'm, I'm speaking to you as if you had said any such thing. You 
Please, is a question there. Thank you. Please. Yes. Sorry. I guess I'm just wondering. I'm wondering about the the quote about hygiene. Um, that, that humanism is hygienically necessary. And I guess I'm just wondering if, for that reason, it might run up against poetry sometimes. That some that somehow, if maybe maybe sometimes poetry doesn't want to simply be entertained, but instead maybe wants to make it stink. Yeah. I don't know, I mean, maybe, yeah. Well, I think that there is, a, 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 there is an entirely valuable tradition which says, you know, it's said by Cocteau, who's a fraud, but every, every now and then fraud, <laughs> no, every now and then fraudulent people say things that are really true. Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's villains are always saying, his frauds are always saying wonderfully wise, true thing. It would be very nice if, 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 if fraudulent people never said true things. Life would be easy. But the, um, the, the, the particular, Cocteau said, if a poet has a dream, it is not of becoming famous, but of being believed. Um, and I think Ezra Pound, uh, terrifically, you know, if you think artists are the antennae of the race, they want to be believed. Cassandra wanted to be believed. Um, um, that said, I think what I was wanting to do with hygiene was to break down any easy suggestion about what is negative and what is positive. Um, when I was a student, we were told that satire was negative. But Pope is only able to rebuke folly and vice by making it perfectly clear what wisdom and, and, and um, true reasoning would consist of. Do you know what I mean? But I think, I think that you're right. I mean, when Eliot says um, that to be restored, our sickness must grow worse. I think he wants you to say, yeah, that's true. That, there are many some situations, and that's all. This is one of them. If we're going to get better, it's going to have to get worse. That is, it's going to have to be some complete collapse of the economic system or something like that. Um, but there are a lot of things that are in the poems where it's not clear that you're being asked. I mean, what are you being asked to do with um, arms that are bracelets and white and bare, but in the lamplight down? with light brown hair. I mean, what, what is that wanting to do? It is wanting to give you thinking and feeling simultaneously in some way, isn't it? But I haven't got, I think it's a good question to which I don't have a good answer. Please. Hi, my name is Bishan Chen. Um, my question is about humanism. Uh, There's one common experience we all have is that we have to um, meet strangers every day. And there are a couple of scenarios you can do with the strangers. You either say, um, say hello to them, or you nod in your smile, or you nod and totally. And what kind of humanism is that? And what a good humanist, in your opinion, will do in that situation? And could hum all human beings have a united belief of humanism? And if we can have one, what kind of united belief um, I'm not an anthropologist, though my son-in-law is, but um, the, it's, it's essentially a question about essentialism, isn't it? That is, we're saying, is it, is it true that human beings, by and large, have felt the same thing? You know, the mother who loses a child, the stillborn child. You know, so we're thinking, um, Essentialism comes and goes. And I don't know whether it's as rude a word as it was a while ago. Essentialism meant any belief that there was something that transcended culture. Everything is culturally conditioned, absolutely everything. So that we we may have agreed, we may have agreed to to these social codes. Um, the great 20th century writers, I think, are repeatedly on the alert against what Eliot himself calls human illusions of feeling. And the illusions of feeling, that is, Eliot says about Stendhal, that some of his scenes read like cutting one's own throat. They are a positive <laughs> humiliation to read in their understanding of human feeling and human illusions of feeling. And there are illusions of feeling in the area that you've just described. I mean, one of my children can't bear it 
the kind of false love which emanates from people if they see a baby. And uh, so you're on Martha's Vineyard as a baby, and there's a sort of simpering that people are doing about it. Uh, you, they don't actually say, oh, but their faces are saying, oh, and in fact, they don't care if the baby were eaten by you. They actually, <laughs> they actually wouldn't care about it. This is this terrible feeling that the, the, the half of the feelings that are out there are whipped up by newspapers and completely bogus. And that includes the social conventions. Dr. Johnson's great remark is, clear your mind of Kant. Uh, that is, it is necessary on occasion, as he himself says, to say things. People have had a terrible journey. You say, I'm sorry you had such a terrible journey. He immediately says, you know, I'm just sorry at all. You don't care whether they had a terrible journey. The social life requires you to say things, but don't believe them. Don't let them get into your mind. Don't let them kid you that you... Don't be kidded that you care. Um, the beginning of wisdom and care is not being taken in. So that, for me, will be in the vicinity of an answer to a question about... It's the sort of thing that Irving Goffman writes very beautifully about. Goffman writes always about a particular... Particular occasions on which you perform, but he clearly thinks that human beings are performing animals, and that it would be a counterpart to this in a different culture. Have we shot my bolt? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comments.